Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Aoife. Thank you, Alex. Um, so our next panel will be discussing um, abortion services, repeal the 8th. But I just want to come back on something that you said, Dr Murphy, earlier. In terms of implementing these services in Ireland, we know the World Health Organization published some information recently on the challenges that countries face. Are there unique challenges here in Ireland for us? How, how are we going to deal with this? Um, abortion is a reality in the reproductive lives of women in every country in the world. And Ireland has, is, is behind the curve. But we have an opportunity to be future and solution focused. We can learn from the problems that other countries um, had. And I think two of the key enablers that have promoted world class um, and evidence based women centered services are political leadership from the very top. And I think some credit has to go to um, Minister Simon Harris uh, in his campaigning. But equally, we have to enable healthcare practitioners and we have to promote that culture. And two months out from providing services, I think there are questions for both of those aspects. From a legislative aspect, and I'm not a, I'm not a legislator, we, we know that needless restrictions are creeping into this legislation. We should have exclusion zones in that legislation to protect women when they're walking into hospitals and into their clinics. We, there's, it, it, there are issues that the same healthcare practitioner has to be present to provide all aspects over a week and that doesn't pay heed to the normal human resources in hospital settings or in, in primary care settings. And contraception. We need, women need free contraception and that was not part of this service and that was promised in the Joint Directors Committee. So we have to be honest about those mistakes. They're not there. But we also have to then create the clinical guidelines and their obstetricians and GPs and experts that are doing that at the moment and working very hard. And we also need to resource it. We must resource. If the resources don't follow, well, really, there isn't really a commitment to right the wrongs of the past. So there are all the challenges that I see, but I think we absolutely need political leadership right now, and the Labour Party has that leadership. And I think we also need to really empower healthcare providers who are committed to providing care. And we really need to enable and support them. Okay, on that, we will hand over to our panel. Thank you, Alex. Okay, um, we have some new people to meet. Uh, thank you, Aoife. Um, Louise Kenny, Professor Louise, Louise Kenny um, is right here. Kathleen Lynch, you all know, my former colleague and our uh, wonderful uh, Cork North Central candidate in the next general election. Uh, <laughs> Jerry Burke, also a party colleague of ours, obstetrician in, uh, in Limerick. And Louise Caffrey, right down the end of the panel there, is an assistant professor of uh, social policy in, uh, in Trinity. Um, Louise Kenny, I'm go was going to come to you first, and I'm going to ask a very sort of obvious question, and perhaps a naive one, and for a man, uh, not a very safe one. Um, uh, but, see, but nevertheless serious, why would there, and why should there be a concentration on women's health? Because we, we, want, we, want a better women, we want a better health service for all of us. What are the particular issues that give rise to the need for a concentration in public policy on women's health? Well, you're absolutely right. I think um, we need to concentrate on the health service in the round. But the reason why we are so passionate about focusing on women and children is because traditionally, uh, historically, uh, in other parts of the world, it is often the case that women and children always fall to the bottom of the health agenda. Um, and, th and that's been shown the world over. As soon as there is competition for budgets, women and children's health falls down the, the pecking order. There are numerous reasons for that. Many of the conditions that women get, like pregnancy, um, some of the gynecological conditions, they don't end up on trolleys in A&E every winter. So there isn't a trolley crisis. There isn't a, you know, a, a political imperative to, to fix things that don't make the headlines. And so because of that, women and children are, are vastly behind the curve. And if you look at, for example, um, the infrastructure in which we currently provide care for pregnant women, uh, in this country. It's Victorian, it's Dickensian in, it, in its nature. And that investment is, um, is very much needed and very much late. So I think that's why we have the focus, that's why we're so passionate about focusing on women and children. Because historically, there has been a, a neglect in that area and we're vastly behind the curve. Kathleen. 
Would you agree, and from your experience as a, as a minister mm. and from your knowledge of the system, obviously particularly disability and, and mental health, but also the broader question? Well, I do, I do think that at the end of the day, it is the, the women that nag everyone else about their health. You know, it's about, um, you know, you, you need to get that checked out and yet not taking a great deal of notice of our own health. And there are particular conditions that are unique to women, uh, I think, as everyone knows. But we, we do our very best to ensure that our children are healthy, that our partners are healthy, that our general family in a wider sphere is healthy, whilst we don't take that much notice of our own health. And I think that, the, 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 I suppose, the, the unintended consequence of introducing the under sixes free GP care, which we did in government, is that parents now have to go to the GP because they're going with their child that they assume is sick and maybe they're in need of a little bit of reassurance and maybe the child needs uh, to be dealt with, but they're in there as well. And I think that's one of the unintended consequences that actually has had a good effect uh, on women and their health because you know while the child is being undressed and being checked out by the GP then you know women are inclined to talk more than men as you've probably noticed but you know it is about um, it is ab it is about saying you know I'm very worried about you know one thing or another and in that respect it actually brings into being their mental health as well and women do worry I think more than men of course there are exceptions uh, you know uh, I'm not saying there aren't but there are exceptions but women do worry uh, uh, about how to hold the family together you know how the household is running and you know, they do to a great extent feel that they are the people that needs to support everyone else and I think from that from that point of view we need to take a serious look at how women look after their own health. I do think as well, Don, I, I, I will stop on this point, that uh, whilst we're looking at, I suppose, access and uh, the different types of conditions that women have and why we, we don't access as much as we should, I think what we are forgetting as well is that uh, there is not just uh, a gender element of this, but there is most definitely a class element to health as well. And I think we, if we produce a health document as the Labour Party that only, is only gender-based and doesn't take class into consideration, class, levels of education, information, how that's accessed, how we understand it, then I think we will be failing a whole section of society. <laughs> Thanks, Kathleen. And just to note as well the presence of our party leader in the audience uh, this morning with us, uh, Brendan Howland, TD. <laughs> Jerry, you're both a party colleague and a practitioner and obstetrician in Limerick. Um, how do you see these, these issues, particularly in the context of women's health? And so, so I'm particularly interested in, in the business of having babies. And, um, I'm sure you'll agree that for human beings in general, there's nothing more important than having a baby. And having the baby safely, getting a good outcome, and having a very positive experience. There's nothing more positive than a baby. Um, it's very important work. And I have to commend politicians in general, um, not just from this part, but in general, the approach to some of the events that have happened in the last 10 years have been, uh, there's been very strong political reaction. And they've started to put in place um, mechanisms to deal with uh, the issues. For example, the national uh, maternity strategy, um, the, the uh, abortion referendum. These were driven by po politicians. Uh, the public were involved as well, of course, but it required a big political involvement. In the national uh, maternity strategy, there are some very important items, uh, for example, uh, perinatal mental health, a very neglected subject. Yes. And it's something that, uh, you, you know, we got 77 recommendations out of this strategy. And uh, in Limerick, it was failed to me to make a priority list. So I, I picked the safety one, which is very, very important, the prevention of neonatal brain injury. If we can eradicate or at least reduce that by half, as, as 
Britain is trying to do as well, but very, very major um, impact for, for individual families, but also for costs. And the second thing that I prioritised, and we, we rolled it out earlier this year, is a perinatal mental health service. So, um, you know, mental health issues are commonplace, and they're commonplace in the pregnant and postnatal population. So it's very important that the politicians actually drove this document and that it has been backed up with investment, and we've seen investment. So I'm grateful to politicians for this because, um, you know, politicians can save a lot more lives than Louise and I can, ever. So, so the Minister for Health, is, that's a really, really important job. Okay. Louise, um, Louise Caffrey, um, I mentioned at the start um, of our session that really the two events, and I was supposed to be drawing maybe a, a tenuous link between the repeal of the 8th and the cervical cancer uh, controversy, and of course they're two different things, but they're, in many ways they come back to the same or similar set of issues, for women in particular. Mm. Um, so we've had the repeal, um, and we now have the legislation starting to go through the, the houses. What do you see as being the, the big priorities there in terms of the services and the implementation of the services for women mm, across I the country? I suppose, first of all, the, the issue is to get the legislation passed um, because, of course, despite the landslide result in the referendum, nothing has actually changed at the moment for women and their partners. So women are still being forced to go to other countries' mm. health services to access abortion services. Women are still most likely taking abortion pills uh, without medical supervision in Ireland. So the, the priority is absolutely to get that legislation passed as quickly as possible and then to implement it. But of course a, a right in law is not the same as a right which you can necessarily access in practice and I think that's where the focus has to be. And it's really important that in the process of passing this legislation that we think through all of the possible ways in which we can make sure that this, these rights are accessible. So some of the big issues are, for example, around conscientious objection, um, which is something that's been talked about quite a bit, that doctors, we've heard, are likely to have a right to conscientious objection in the bill. And in a way, so that, that of course is the right that if you're a doctor who disagrees morally with abortion services, that you don't have to provide those services. And in a way, that in itself isn't necessarily problematic, but it can impede access if it's not dealt with properly. Mm. So some ways of dealing with it might be to provide lists of um, of doctors who are willing to provide services so that women can safely navigate to, to providers who are willing to provide those services. But within that, of course, it's really important as well that there are referral processes and that those referral processes are timely and they're governed by strict guidelines um, around the doctors referring very, very quickly to service providers who are willing to provide those services. Mm -hmm. And that there need to be implications, of course, consequences if that referral process isn't done within those strict guidelines. Mm -hmm. But both of those ways of dealing with the issue, in some ways, place the onus on service users to access, to enable their right to abortion services, because it means that the service user has to navigate those lists, they have mm -hmm. to navigate a referral process. Another way of doing things might be to think about placing the onus on the service provider, in this case the state, to enable that right, to enable access. And something that the state could potentially look into is mandating that um, hospitals and perhaps GP practices have a certain number of doctors who are willing to provide abortion services. And if we find that we currently don't have enough, then perhaps the next time those jobs come up, we could mandate that those jobs include providing abortion services. Louise, Kenny, from your experience in the UK system, you, you obviously you know both systems, mm -hmm. are we, have we lessons to learn or have we things to avoid or Absolutely. what would you say? Um, mm. I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that um, since we repealed the 8th in May, uh, the Liverpool Women's Hospital, when I now currently work, has treated more than 50 women who have travelled because of fatal fetal abnormality. And that's just one hospital. And in fact, there were women uh, booked to attend uh, the Liverpool Women's next week. So there is an urgency around, around introducing this legislation. But in that urgency, I don't think we should rush and get it wrong. We have a chance to provide something that truly is world class. And some elements of the proposed legislation really concern me. In the UK at the moment, we are trying to actually decriminalize abortion completely. Uh, we're trying to make it a much more um, 
uh, Liberal Act decriminalise all, all aspects of, of abortion, and it's been a, a passionate objective of our current chair of the Royal College to, to do that. Here in Ireland, we're actually now talking about some proposed legislation that will actually, I think, potentially limit abortion for those women who are most vulnerable. Mm. So, for example, the, the need to have a three-day wait. I, I think that's patronising. By the time a woman sees her health... <laughs> By the time a woman sees her healthcare provider, be it a doctor or an obstetrician, to request a termination of pregnancy, she has thought about it to the end of the world and back. She doesn't need to wait another three days. That wait will harm the women who are most vulnerable and most marginalized, the women who've take, taken everything that they can to pluck up the courage because they're a victim of rape or domestic abuse, to be told, great, go away and come back in three days, it's really harmful and it's patronising, and I think that should be struck out of the legislation. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there, we'll try to maybe come back to some of those questions in a minute, but for the moment, uh, Aoife, I think you have some other people there to talk to. We heard some discussion there on access to mental health services, and Letty McCarthy, you wanted to talk about children's access to mental health services and when the child turns 18. I did, Aoife, and thank you very much, and if I may briefly, just to, to follow up on this, where we're talking about mental health, um, or we're talking about women's health, GPs in my area are telling me there is a waiting list of 10 to 12 months for ultrasounds in, in our local hospitals. And, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you just think about that, 10 to 12 months is completely unacceptable for people to have to wait that length, and we do need to do something about that. And in terms of, of mental health and once they become 18, and I'm sure everybody here in this room, you don't need to be a politician, I'm sure you all know families who have children with physical or mental disabilities. And it's hard enough to find services for them during their age. We know many families who have spent their lives fundraising. And that is so cruel and that is so wrong that we expect families to do that because they haven't access to schools or to a proper education for their youngsters. But once they get to 18 years of age, they are literally handed back to their parents. The parents are 20 years older. And, you know, where is the stimulation for that youngster? An 18-year-old that, that finishes school, that can go to college, go traveling, go abroad, go working, all of those things. But somebody with the disabilities that I was speaking about this morning in my motion, those opportunities are not open to them. And we need a service that can provide that. Apparently, there is a budget there if you can navigate through that. But that should not be the job of the parents, the families, and the carers. That should be the job of the state, where they can go and say, right, this is what we have in place for your young person so they can live a proper life and that they have access to good quality of life. And I, I really want to see us as a Labour Party pursuing that for the sake of all of those families. Okay, thank you, Letty. We'll hand back to Alex. Kathleen, respond to that. There are issues that you're very familiar with. Very familiar with, and uh, basically uh, what happens uh, when a child reaches 18, uh, it is always astonishing to me that the, you know, that the, the end of June, end of July, always comes as a surprise to the service provider. Um, when, when we were in government, uh, it happened one year, and then I said, look, in February of every year, we will know exactly who's coming out of that system and what are we going to do about it. So what we did was we kind of did as if it were third level applications. And, you know, the people coming out of the system, uh, you know, we knew where they were, we knew what could be provided, and there wasn't enough to be provided, but nevertheless, no one was without a particular service. But what struck me during all of that, and I think where the Labour Party needs to be going, is that the service on offer from the service provider. And, uh, you know, uh, service providers are doing a job since the, the 30s, 40s, 50s that the state refused to do. It's as simple as that. And so we shouldn't condemn them for that. But what they have on offer in, in, in when children uh, exit, if you like, second level, is what's on their menu, 
rather than what's necessary or what the person themselves would like. So there is no choice. Here's our menu. What would you like to do? Come into our service and this is what we will provide you with. Rather than taking a look at the individual, saying what's best suited to their needs. And that's really where we were working towards, that kind of individualization that allowed people to have as good a life as you can because none of us have the perfect life. You know, but we should allow other people as well to have as good a life as you can. And that is what's important about disability. Uh, and not, not one size fits all. And we need to start recognizing that. Now, I do know that the government has a committee in place on individualization and uh, individual payments. I think it will probably be a pilot program. I think it will be a long way down the road. But to meet that, we really need to start saying to the service providers who get paid in a block grant, I have X amount of people, this is how much you're going to get. We really need to start saying to them that you need to change your practice sure. too. Okay, there are, there are a, number of other a number of other issues I want to come back to our, um, our guests on, but Aoife, I think there are two other people with you there which are, who have things to say very close on point here. Alex, yeah, I have Sean O'Ruddick here beside me. Shona, you want to speak to us very quickly about women's mental health. Yeah, I suppose the first thing I'd like to say is how I know that for the future, but how incredibly inspiring they are, that they are having a huge impact on the present. I know everyone who has listened to them would have felt that, and I think having listened to Vicky, her story in terms of how she was dealt with, her mental and physical, her mental and psychological um, needs, it wasn't even an issue. There, there simply are no services there, and that's what I'm seeing the whole time. Um, I think we can't un underestimate them as role models in terms of changing the conversation around the need for mental health provision in every way. Um, and from what I see, it's badly, badly needed, and it has to become a political issue. Okay, thank you very much. And I, Verna McGovern. McGowan, when we talk about um, mental health services, of course, one thing we need to take into consideration is violence against women and access to these types of services and how important they are. How are we doing right now? Absolutely. Well, first of all, it's just been an honour to share a stage you know, with Vicky and Stephen and others. And what strikes me, I work for many years uh, for a leading human rights organisation at European level. They're human rights defenders, they're agents of change. The ground is shaking beneath us in Ireland with the women who took to the streets you know, for the repeal. But the bigger question and the onus of all of us, you know, entering the political world is why do we need such personal strategy, personal tragedies to spur change? We need systemic long term vision so those systems don't do that. A second brief point that, that links on that is to say that we can talk about different aspects of gender health and from a human rights based approach again, but until we have universal health care, those you know, those it's almost pointless to talk about that. The determinants of well-being, they're to do with your socioeconomic status, they're to do with your shelter, your housing, all of those things. So we need to really broaden that conversation. Indeed, on violence against women in particular, and again, maybe coming from a European perspective, I find it astounding um, that in Ireland, a country that abroad champions itself on human rights, still hasn't ratified the Istanbul Convention. And why that's important, and a number of speakers have mentioned that, is that focuses also on the psychological harm and the need not just for the legal, I guess, safeguards, but really changing that culture that doctors ask the right questions, that the right service is in place, and that even our judges and frontline defenders are there to really give a holistic approach to the well-being and health of women in Ireland. And that's really what I would like to emphasize is that holistic approach going forward. Thank you very much, Averna. And back over to you, Alex. Dermil Margot, Aoife. On that point, that holistic Point. And Jerry, you sort of touched on it there when you were talking about politicians and the impact politicians can have. And I know when I was a minister of the Department of Health, the thing that strikes you always is that you can't really talk about health just in the context of health policy because the broader context of social and economic uh, circumstances that people find themselves in, the pressures that they're under, particularly women we're talking about this morning, they always have to be factored in and always have to be understood as part of the necessary policies. So it isn't just about the health issues, it isn't just about the doctors, the medics, it's also about an understanding of where all these problems come from. Would you, would you agree with that, Louise? Absolutely, yeah. Um, if you think about the social context in which repeal was set, the women that we were advocating for, the, um, particularly uh, women who were living on the margins of society, uh, victims of domestic abuse, um, uh, violence in the home, victims of rape, 
um, fixing access to a healthcare procedure is just the tip of the iceberg. Prevention goes so much deeper to the heart of society and, and fixing the, the fabric of society that has caused those issues. Absolutely. Okay. Jerry, um, I suppose it's, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's really just a development of the point you're making yourself, isn't it? But as a doctor, as a practitioner like Louise, do you, you know, do you see those, obviously you see the circumstances that people are in, but do, does it factor into the kind of care that you can give people? Of course it does. Uh, I, I mean, when I, when I went to Limerick first 26 years ago, I was completely appalled by the amount of poverty that I saw in my clinic. Um, there have been social interventions and improvements in, in, the, in that quarter of a century, and it is much better, I have to say. Uh, it, it's not as bad as it was. But uh, we tend to concentrate on the biomedical aspects of health, and a lot of the decision-making falls to you know, doctors and uh, physicians and professors and whatever. But, but um, the determinants really go, go way back to childhood. Most important thing, and I'm very glad that the, the Labour Party is doing this, is to eradicate child poverty. Mm -hmm. And in the long run, there will be nothing. If you, if you eradicate child poverty and have children growing up in a nice house, in a nice green environment, uh, they will live a lot longer. They'll have a much better, they will be happier, mm -hmm. they'll be thinner, uh, they'll have lower blood pressure, they'll have less diabetes. We, we, we know all this. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very important that the Labour Party and similarly minded parties actually grasp that and start back there. I, I always think of the Labour Party as a, a party of Samaritans. Um, we're a Samaritan one way of looking at us, I we're, suppose. We are a Samaritan party. When somebody stumbles and falls, one of us is there to um, lift them up, carry them if necessary. And I think that's, that really should be uh, the way we behave. And if all politicians did that, we'd have a much better healthier, happier mm. society. Mm -hmm. Just um, what, what we're saying in our, in our policy document, which we're publishing this weekend, is that any strategy on women's health must extend beyond the traditional domain of health care and address the social factors which contribute to high rates of ill health among women. Louise, would you say that that's a good focus? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, the context of Ireland at the moment is one of economic recovery and it's really important to acknowledge that. But at the same time, despite all of that positivity, you know, 16% of people in Ireland do still live in poverty. And I think it's really important to remember that. I think one in 11 people in Ireland experience food poverty. So, you know, poverty hasn't by any stretch of the imagine gone away. And inequality is certainly, a, you know, a very big issue in Ireland. So tackling health on its own, you know, it, health doesn't happen in a bubble, health happens in society and society is about issues of poverty, inequality and you know, issues around social justice, what kind of society do we want to make, what kind of changes do we want to make to enable issues like health and to do that you have to look holistically at, at the whole society. Yeah. And Kathleen, just to finish on that, mm -hmm. I mean, picking up on Jerry's point about politicians and governments, it is important to remember that there have been incredible advances Huge in our advances. health system. And, and yeah. also, just since we're, it's a Labour Party conference, we're all Labour Party mm. people, well, no, we're not all, we've guests here as well, and we're delighted to have them, but it's a party conference. Um, we did very important things in government, including in the teeth of, a, of the worst recession the country ever saw, and including in the Department of Health, where you and I served together. A little bit of self-praise, but I think it's the party and the government, pe people like Eamon Gilmore, Joan Burton, Brendan Howland, actually fighting for the resources that you and I needed in the Department of Health when it was bloody hard to get them. And I, I think as a recognition of that, um, as soon as the last government was formed, a particular organisation, I won't name them, would be unfair, a particular organisation uh, to deal with mental health employed uh, a consultant. And he phoned me to tell me that uh, I just told him, he said, that the reason they won't make as many advances is they haven't got a Kathleen Lynch and they haven't got a Brendan Howland and they haven't got an Alex White. And that's the reason that you won't make as many advances and things. But in terms of mental health, when we were in government and in the teeth of the worst collapse that this country has seen, 
uh, we did get additional money for new developments. It wasn't about putting it back into the old system. It was about new developments. Um, a central mental hospital that had been promised uh, for, I think, 70 years, Brendan, 70 years, we managed to get the money for. You know, it is, it is about the under sixes, which is, I think is the best thing that any government has done in relation <laughs> in relation to what Jury has pointed out and our other panellists have pointed out in relation to child poverty. But that was only part of the plan, Alex, as you know. Mm. The next part of the plan, and it's there, and it's in place, was to bring it to the under-12s and then to the under-18s, which would just leave us then with the, the report this week that talks about the Twilight Group, mm. the group just over the threshold, but unable to afford it. And I gave, and there was opposition to that under-sixes. Mm. There was huge opposition. And they came in and they berated us. You are giving medical cards, she told me, to to the, the higher echelons of the middle classes, I was told. And then I spoke about someone I knew who, a postwoman, a postman, who had paid out 200 euros the week before for their sick child. Three visits to the doctor and medication. Now, that's hardly the higher echelons of the middle classes. But I do think it's important that this morning's focus, I think, even though it has been brought back uh, on several occasions, is about what's to be delivered. I come back again to the fact that a lot of people out there, mainly women, don't understand what is on offer. <laughs> and even if they get the information, they can't assimilate it to themselves and we need to start the education as well as offering services. Mm. Education is vitally important when it comes to health. Okay, Kathleen Lynch, <laughs> Louise Kenny, Louise Caffrey, Jerry Burke, thank you very much. Aoife. Thank you Alex. Linda Kelly, maternity services as a new mother and cohort, by the way, I know this is quite close to your heart as a campaigner as well. Can you tell us, if you don't mind, a little bit about your own experience of these services? Yeah, well, I just had a baby at the end of June, and I would have... <laughs> She's lovely. Um, and I suppose I went public, which seemed a shock to a lot of people. It never even entered my mind to go for private maternity services. And I have to say the maternity and infant care scheme is a public service that we as a country can be very proud of. And I think it's really important. Public services get such a bad rap and we need to be proud of them. But what I will say is that my experience, particularly around the birth, was quite mixed. And it comes back to something which is named in the Labour Party document, which is around male-dominated health services. Services. So I was very lucky throughout my pregnancy to be able to access the Domino scheme, which is a midwife-led scheme, which is only available in Dublin, Cork, Waterford and Wexford. Don't ask me why, because I'd probably give you a very cynical answer. Um, but I had difficulties at the birth and um, I was there 36 hours after being admitted and the consultant came along to make a decision about whether we'd go further for an induction or whether we'd go for a caesarean. And he looked at me and he just said, sure, we'll give it a go. And that was the level of his medical advice to me in terms of making a choice about the birth of my baby. And I'm not a shy person, I'm not a retiring person, but I was so powerless in that moment to actually advocate for myself. And four months later, that feeling is still with me. And it wasn't until two days later, a midwife came to me and she explained the medical reasons why it was important for me to labour all through the night um, before I was then rushed for an emergency C-section. And to me, there is a direct cause and effect between the fact that the upper echelons of obstetrics, gynaecology, the Irish Health Service, the Department of Health, and all senior decision makers in this country are men, and the lack of priority that is given to women's health, there is a cause and effect between those two things. And it is radical that that is named in the Labour Party document because there are plenty of people outside of this room, people watching at home who will think that that's a, a you know a red herring, that that's got nothing to do with it but there are systemic inequalities against women and to me that is a cause and effect of the fact that it is male dominated at the higher levels and I think as a party the fact we've named that in the policy is so radical and something for us to be very proud of. Linda Kelly thank you so much.